Hey everyone, in this tutorial we're going to talk about how you can export your iRay renders and customize them in various ways in Adobe After Effects to get some pretty cool results. You can see on the screen here that we have a nice looking render of this medieval scene already done in the iRay Render Preview window. What we're going to take a look at first is the Compositing Elements section that allows you to export different render passes to be used in After Effects later on. Compositing Elements can be found close to the bottom of the Render Settings tab. Currently the only element set for export is the RGB, but if you want to add others, you can select them and they will appear in the drop down menu in your iRay Render Preview window. You can see the preview of each element by selecting it from the drop down menu as well. Let's take a look at the Depth element first, which enables depth and distant range settings in the Settings panel. If you adjust the near slider to a higher value, you'll end up showing objects that are closer to the camera, and you can see items closer to the camera have a higher white value. The same goes for the far slider. If you increase the far slider, then it's going to show more detail for items in the distance. Let's take a look at Ambient Occlusion, or AO. AO and Shadow Passes can only be exported when iRay is set to Interactive Mode, so let's do that first, and then activate the AO in the Preview Render window to take a look at that element. This is what After Effects will use for an ambient occlusion map later on. Okay, so let's take a look at the export settings by selecting Render Scene. The default render is set to Standalone Render, but we're going to take a look at how to save an MI scene for render with iRay Standalone first, so let's select that instead. Notice the folder path where we're saving the MI scene. There will be a resource folder there, which will load into iRay Standalone momentarily. After we render the MI scene, we'll load up the iRay standalone and enter in the same directory for our source path and select the MI resources folder. Next, we need to select all the compositing elements that we want to export and then start the render. What we're going to have after the render is finished is an image of each element for each frame of your render. You can see here that we have AO, Normal, Depth, Material ID, and RGB images all in PNG format, one image for each frame. Let's load in the RGB image sequence first by going up to Import File and then selecting the zero frame of our RGB sequence. You'll want to make sure here that the PNG sequence is selected when you do so, otherwise you're only going to import a single frame. Once you have it in your library, click and drag it down to the Create a New Composition button to do just that. Create a new composition based on the settings of the image sequence. We can scrub through the timeline to see the brief zoom in of our scene, which we exported from iClone. Let's bring in our Material ID sequence first, for some partial color adjustment. Again, the same process to import, but we'll just drag it down to create a new layer this time. We can toggle its visibility by selecting the little eye icon on the left of the layer as well. What we're going to do next is search for a color key effect, and then apply it directly to the Material ID layer. Then use the eyedropper tool to select the bricks so we can adjust the color of the brick wall separately. Once we do, you'll see the entire material ID layer change based on our selection. This will be consistent throughout the duration of the entire sequence. What we want to do next is press Ctrl D to duplicate the RGB layer as a background to modify the color a little bit later on. Let's change the second layer to alpha matte now to mask out all the non-brick wall areas. This allows us to adjust the color of the brick walls in the original image independently. Next, let's find a hue effect and apply that to the third layer so we can adjust its color. If we select a red hue, you'll notice that now you can alter those brick colors separately. Let's also add a little bit more saturation and lightness. If you toggle the FX button on and off, you'll be able to see the difference immediately in your main view. And again, this will remain consistent throughout the entire sequence unless you key different values in at different times. Now what we're going to do is add in our AO sequence and set it to multiply mode right off the bat. You can see when we do this, the scene will get substantially darker, so we need to tweak this a little bit. What we need to do in this case is find a curve effect and apply it directly to our AO layer so we can adjust the values. If we take the control point at the top and drag it further to the left, what's going to happen is our scene will brighten up as the values taken from our AO layer are being tamed down a bit. 
This is a really cool effect to use on AO layers, as it allows you to fully customize the amount of depth you want in certain areas of your scene, in particular underneath the arches in our scene. Here's a beautiful looking render of what we have so far. Next up we're going to take a look at creating a depth of field effect using our depth sequence, as well as a small blur effect. So starting off with the same RGB sequence as the main layer in our composition, let's import in the depth sequence the same way as before, and you'll see the eerie looking results in our main view. Let's search for a level effects now, so we can use it to set the DOF strength. Once it's applied to our depth layer, you'll see that we can manipulate the black input much like we did with multiply with the AO effect earlier. This is going to determine the focal point of our scene. Anything white will be clear, black will be blurry, and the various shades of gray will create a transition between the two. But first let's duplicate our RGB layer and set the second one as luma matte, so that we can create the blur effect later. Next, let's search for the camera lens effect and apply it to the original RGB layer. Here, we'll want to tweak the blur radius to strengthen the effect, and also select Repeat Edge Pixels in order to rectify imperfections at the edge of our image. After we're done that, what we can do now is tweak our depth layer to get a stronger or weaker DOF effect, depending on the look we're going for. Here's a nice look at the DOF effect in action. For our next trick, we're going to take a look at creating a god ray and a lens flare. Exciting stuff! The god ray can be created using the depth passes, so let's use that first. First, let's find the invert effect and apply it to our depth layer. Basically, this just inverts the values of our depth pass. Next, we're going to find a CC radial fast blur and do the same. You can click on the little control point in the middle of the viewport at this point to determine where the center of the blur is going to be. You can click and drag it around. You can see that once we adjust the amount of blur, our fabled god rays will begin to form, and it will appear as though they're emanating from our light source, which is the sun behind the buildings. What we can do then is adjust our depth layer to a lighten property, after which you'll see it change to simulate the god rays we've been waiting for. After that, we can adjust the opacity of that layer to even it out a little bit, and finalize the center position of our blur. If we want, we can also add in a curve effect to manipulate the god rays in even more detail. Next, let's take a look at how to apply a lens flare effect. We can repeat the same process to search for it, and then apply it to our depth layer, and center it so that it's centered in a similar position to our radial blur. What we want to do next is make sure that the blur and lens effects are connected so they follow each other. So what we're going to do is dig down into the effects and find the flare center property, and add a key there by clicking the stopwatch. What we want to do then is click and drag from the pick whip icon all the way up to the center property of the radial blur effect. After that, the two are effectively linked. As you can see, when I move the center of the blur now, the glare effect will follow. This is a pretty common and useful effect you can add to any composition. Here's what it'll look like once everything is done. The second last thing we're going to explore is how to create a fog type effect using the depth sequence. As you can see, it's becoming quite useful. So again, we're going to start off this composition the same, with the depth sequence on top, and the RGB map, as well as a duplicate below it. Again, we'll change that original layer to a Luma matte mask, and this time, we're going to add in a fractal noise effect to the RGB track. Let's change the fractal type to dynamic, and then scale it way up so we can have a much blurrier fog. We can also tweak the opacity as well. However, now when we scrub through the sequence, the fog is staying in the same place, which looks a little bit weird. So we're going to set some keys for animation. All we have to do is set a key for offset turbulence at the beginning, then head to the last frame, change the value to the side of it, and then repeat the process. Now when we scrub through, we get a nice rolling fog effect. We can do the same thing with the evolution parameter to make it appear as though the fog is getting darker as we move forward. Again, let's add a level effect to the depth layer so we can tweak this even further. Eventually, we can get a sweet looking result like this. 
Okay, so finally we're going to learn how to use the normal sequence to create some light reflections from the surface of the objects in our scene. For this effect, we're going to use a plugin graciously provided by Stefan Minning called Normality, which you can access from this site. We can find this under the Effects menu. Let's apply it to a composition that just has our normal sequence for now. We'll have a black screen at first, so what we need to do is go into our Normals values and select our Normal Map. After that, we need to create a new light so we can actually see our scene. I can move this light wherever I want in the scene, and you can see the light and shadow changes on all of the surfaces. In this next night composition, we have RGB, Material ID, and Normal Sequences all together. We've used the Material ID map, similar to what we did earlier with the bricks, to mask out the sky and replace it with a dark, starry evening sky image. Okay, so let's get started by importing in our Normal Sequence and applying that same effect. We're going to do the same thing and create the light, although this time we're going to change the color to a nice warm orange color to simulate torchlight. We'll move the light over to behind one of the columns so it appears that maybe there's a torch back there somewhere. Then we'll set our normal layer to add and you'll see the light appear nicely around where that column is. From there, we can tweak the intensity value for a more subdued glow. Next, under Light Options in the Normal track, let's Alt and left-click the Intensity to create an Expression track. Let's enter in a wiggle value of 5 and 5 to simulate the flickering light effect from a torch. Once we're done that, you can see the cool looking playback. And that's all there is to it. All of this can be achieved by exporting the different composition elements from your iRay render in order to customize with various effects in Adobe After Effects. So thanks so much for watching guys, and as always make sure to check out our forums at forum.reillusion.com, and I'll see you in the next video.